right, welcome to Fiber Channel Sand Boot. In our data centers, we no longer like to have local storage on our machines. One of the big reasons, of course, is that it is not very efficient, nor necessarily it's a speed. But perhaps even a more important reason is environments like UCS, where we have those cool service profiles that can move from one, log from one blade to another blade, and that service profile has all the definition of that server, all the characteristics of that server, and I move it over here, that's great, but if I have a local hard disk, well, I'm leaving information behind. And that really gets rid of my service profile mobility, because now I'd have to go out there and move that little hard disk from one to the other. So sand boot's a necessity. We have different ways to sand boot, all right? We can sand boot iSCSI, or in this case, we're going to be using fiber channel to do our sand booting from. So Fiber channel is just another type of networking. It's on the storage side. Many of us are familiar with Ethernet and IP and all that kind of stuff. Well, this is going to be different. We still have our types of addresses, and we still have certain things going on where we're controlling traffic, and a lot of other things will be very similar to what we do in our traditional networking side, but now we're in storage networking. So we'll take a look at a few different components and try to understand what's going on in these environments. Now, when we start off our story, what we're going to do is we're going to build out a storage network. So first of all, we're going to start with just a server. All right. So a regular server, we're used to putting Ethernet cards in. All right. And so we'll put Ethernet cards. But now what we're going to do is on this server, we're going to put a different type of card. This is a card for fiber channel. Okay. This type of card is called an HBA. All right. This is a host bus adapter. All right. And so you can kind of think about it is if you're used to go ahead and put in an Ethernet card and plug in your Ethernet cables, well, now you're going to put an HBA in, all right, where you would normally uh, in place, well, you still have your Ethernet card there. Um, you put your HBA in and you'll plug your fiber channel interfaces. Unlike Ethernet adapters, we're going to find most of these typically have two fiber channel connectors. Storage is super critical. We have to have storage network up and running. So when we build out fiber channel networks, we usually build out two fabrics, a fabric A and a fabric B. And that way, if either fabric fails, we will still have connectivity. So our host bus adapters will have two, sometimes four, ports on them. And then we also have our network interface card for Ethernet. We can buy something that takes an HBA and an Ethernet card and mushes them together into a single card. And that's called a converged network adapter, or a CNA. Okay. So we plug this into our machine, and then we need to connect it up to our network. So let me go ahead and we'll just build a very simple uh, network here. So I'll pop out a, a storage array. Whee! Okay. And we'll, we'll go ahead. And like I said, we typically have two of these. So then we'll put an MD, a switch here. This could be any type of fiber channel switch. I'll, I'll probably be saying MDS switch because that's usually uh, what I, I'd be using. So we'll go ahead and we'll label these. These are our MDS switches. These are our fiber channel switches. And over here, this is where we have our storage array. And of course, this is our initial server that we're concerned about. So first of all, what we're going to do is we need to cable these guys up, right? We need to link these things together so that they're able to function. So let me go ahead and cable this. We'll call this top fabric, fabric A. All right. We'll call this bottom fabric, fabric B. Now, we notice we're connecting. Now, on the storage array, the storage array also has some fiber channel connectivity and fiber channel ports. All right. And so when we use the storage array, we, we don't think about it. But the internally, there is some type of fiber channel connectivity All right, that's happening inside that storage array uh, that's giving us this connectivity. And again, it, this is connected to both fabrics. So physically, this is how we're cabled up. So we get this all cabled up, we get it up and running, all right, we're kind of chugging along, everything looks great, this looks like an awesome network, all right? I power on my server and nothing happens. And so I'm sad. So I call up the storage guy, and I'm like, hey, Mr. Storage Dude, I connected, I cabled everything in, and my thing won't boot off the sand. He's like, well, okay, well, I need to know some information about your machine. Okay, it, it's, it's a Cisco UCS. Anything else? Well, your HBA, he tells me, has these special numbers burned into it that uniquely identify 
the card. You mean kind of like how MAC addresses uniquely identify an Ethernet card? Yeah, kind of like that, except we have a different types of addresses. The different types of addresses we have are referred to as WWNs, or World Wide Names. And so we worldwide names are what we use to identify our different types of addresses and our different types of characteristics are worldwide names. Now there's a couple different worldwide names. One is called a worldwide node name. All right. A worldwide node name, which you'll see abbreviated a couple different ways. Sometimes you'll see it listed as WWNN, sometimes NWN, sometimes you'll see it NWN or whatever, but it's still referring to a node. Okay, you can think of this pointing to the adapter. Okay, and so in our example, we have a single, we have a single adapter in our server. So we would have one WWN. We'd have a single worldwide node name. However, worldwide port names, unlike node names, these reference ports. So our adapter has two ports. Our adapter would have two WWPNs, but one WWNN. Let's go ahead and let's assign a couple WWPNs just for some clarity. So WWPNs are normally big, long, messy kind of looking. We're going to keep ours short and sweet here to make it simple. And so I'll go ahead and give this guy 777. Again, this is not realistic at all. These are normally long for, this for the bottom port. And for the top port, we'll give it the address of 888. So we have 777, we have 888. All right, and that's what's actually burned into our card. Or if we're using UCS, this would be the number that I assigned to the service profile. Now the storage array, all right, has numbers too. But let's go back to our story. <coughs> So I I'm talking to the storage guy. I'm like, okay, Mr. Storage Guy, you need my WWPNs. How do I get those? He says, well, if you're using UCS, just look in your service profile. But if you're using a traditional server, you have to boot up, and depending on the cards you have, you can hit like Alt-E or Control-Q or something, and you get into the BIOS. Not the BIOS of the computer, but actually the BIOS of that fiber channel host bus adapter. All right, and you can go in there and you can see your WWPNs, and that's what I need. I need your WWPNs. I said, okay, on my Fabric A, I have a WWPN 888, and Fabric B, 777. He says, okay, great. You want to boot from storage. How big a chunk of disk space do you need? He says, I need about 20 gigs of disk space. He says, okay, I'm going to carve you out some space on the storage array. But instead of calling it a partition or a disk or whatever, we're going to refer to it as a LUN. A LUN is a logical unit number. And so the storage administrator is going to carve out a chunk of disk space all right, on this particular storage rate. And then what he needs to do is right now, that 20 disk, he creates it, but he wants to make it available to this particular server. By default, that LUN's not available to anybody until he chooses to make that LUN available. And so what he's going to configure on the server is something called masking. Masking says who can speak to this LUN, who's allowed to access or see this particular LUN. In this case, he's going to allow 777 and 888 to see that particular 20 gigabit LUN. All right, so now on the storage array knows that WWPN 777 and WWNN 888 are what is needed to be able to see that, to be, are allowed to see that particular one. So cool, I'm like, all right, man, hey, thank you, Mr. Storage Guy, you're awesome, I, okay, I'll talk to you later. He says, wait, 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 we're not done. All right, okay, if you boot up right now, you're going to boot up, but your server doesn't know who to talk to. It doesn't know who to try to talk to. It's like, well, what do you mean? Well, when your server boots up, it doesn't know that it's supposed to talk to my storage array. And so we need to tell it that you want to talk to my storage array. It says, well, how do I do that? Well, in that, in your service profile in UCS, or you go through that BIOS stuff on the fiber channel card, there's something called a target. And we can set up targets. We have two fabrics, a fabric A and a fabric B, and we can set up two targets. Typically, one will be our primary, and one will be our secondary in case the primary fails. 
okay, so what's my target going to be? Well, the storage array, just like the server, has its own set of WWPNs, WWNNs, and everything. So on the storage array, let's go ahead and give that one some WWNNs, WWPNs. We'll give it 333 three, three here and 444 four, four here, all right, for WWPNs. So now what you need to do is you need to go into the server, into the, the BIOS, all right, or into your server's profile, and we have to configure targets. All right, we have to configure our different targets that we want to be able to use in our environment. So first of all, for a Fabric A, our target is going to be 333, and for Fabric B, our target is going to be 444. All right, and, and that way when your server boots up, it knows who to talk to. So all is good, I'm like, okay, hey, this looks pretty good. I have it set up now, I have the storage array, I know it's WWPNs are 333 and 444, uh, my WWPNs are 888 and 777, I have my boot set up, I have my target, so my server boots up, it's gonna try to talk first to 333, if I'm choosing to boot from Fabric A first, and if that fails back up to 444. Cool, man, I think I got this. So I turn on my server. My server goes ahead, it boots up, it reads the BIOS or service profile, whatever it needs to go ahead, knows it needs to talk to 333. It tries to talk to the storage array and nothing happens. So I'm like, crap, it's not working, man. I talked to the storage guy, I got my server configured. Hey, but you know, we got those MDS switches. Let me call the MDS switch guys. How you know th th those uh, storage network guys say, hey, see what, see what they're up to. So I call up the MDS guy, I'm like, hey, I'm MDS guy, listen. I did everything the storage array guy told me to do, and it ain't working. He's like, well, just kind of like a access control list on a regular device denies all by default, unless you specifically permit, MDS switches are kind of like that. Unless we allow a specific conversation to occur, all right, then they're not able to communicate. But we don't use access control list in access control, as you know, you can do source destination. What we use instead are something called zones. When two WWPNs, for example, are in the same zone, all right, they can talk to each other. And so what he tells me, he says, well, what I need to do on these switches is I need to configure appropriate zoning so that we can actually talk to each other and get functional. So on these switches, he goes to this first one here, and he has to set up what we call, like I said, on these devices, we're going to set up our zoning. And on this top device, Fabric A, he has to create a zone that allows 888 to be able to talk to 333. And he also has to create a zone that allows 777 to be able to talk to 444. There's other things about making the par part of the active zone set and your zone sets, active zone sets, and other things. But basically, let's think what we have now. We've set up a few different components to make this work. So at this point, we have configured the targets, either in our service profile or in the BIOS, all right, for our server. The storage array guy has carved out a boot one for us, in this case, a 20 gig boot one, and he set up the masking so that specifically 777-888, our WWPNs are able to connect to that 20 gig one. All right, we called up the MDS guys, all right, and they said, hey, we need to allow these guys to talk. They set, did zoning and they created the appropriate zones so that on fabric B, 777 can talk to 444, and on fabric A, 888, can talk to 333. So now let's see what happens. Boom, I power on my server. My server boots up, it finds its boot target 333. It sends a frame across the network. Boom, it's going across the network here, goes up, hits this MDS. The MDS says, oh, this is uh, 888 trying to talk to 333. Yep, that's allowed. Goes down, hits the storage rate. The storage rate receives us. Hey, this is 888. Let me see if I got anything available for him. Looks in the table and says, hey, yeah, 888, I have this LUN and we'll present that LUN back to your server. Boot LUNs are typically presented as LUN zero, but he's gonna present that LUN back to your server. Your server's gonna go ahead and Fiber Channel Card's gonna boot, boot, connect to that 20 gig, and then we'll say, hey, Mr. Server, here's a 20 gig drive you can boot from. And of course, if we don't have an operating system installed, <laughs> okay, we're gonna go ahead and we'll get things, you know, operating system not found, and then we can go ahead and mount a, a disk image 
or you know, however you want to install the operating system and then install it across the SAN and then reboot and then you have the operating system there. So this is fundamentally the concepts that we have when we look at the idea behind SAN boot. So SAN boot's been around a long time, all right? But fundamentally, this is what happens. There's some subtle details and all that. One thing I will point out is notice when we created this LUN, this LUN was just for me. I didn't share this LUN with anybody else because it's for boot. But if this was a LUN that, say, had virtual machines on it, then other servers would also be able to be able to use that LUN. So that's it for uh, Sand Boot. I hope you had got some understanding of some of the cool things that we're able to do and how the basic process of fiber channel booting works. I thank you, and until next time.